I am Linus Vallee. I am the uh, maintainer of uh, the GPIO and pin control subsystems in the Linux kernel. Plus, I do MISC ARM32 maintenance and uh, generally, like, all over the place when I have to be there. I upstream a few boards and so on. Mm, I'm going to talk today, today about GPIO for engineers and makers. I put this title because um, Th those, are, those are used. The, the engineers want to use GPIO for their board support uh, or for their like very, very uh, clearly defined task, let's say. And the makers, they just want to bang the GPIOs to do MISC stuff, interesting things. You're familiar with the maker concept, the maker communities and maker spaces and so on. It's been bust around a lot. And um, I didn't put the IoT in here, I'm sorry. I'm not buzzword compliant, <clears throat> but I did put in the makers. They do have interesting use cases, as we will see. So, so the GPIO subsystem came about in 2006. Until then, GPIO was said, seen as uh, obscurity, just something uh, very local to a certain uh, SOC or uh, PCI ISA card, something like that. The, the, the parallel port on the, the, the first PCs was seen as some kind of homebrew GPIO. It had 24 volts uh, pin, so it was a bit uh, nasty to use. But um, it was seen as, a, as somewhat of an obscurity, not, nothing that really needed a, a subsystem or so. Um, the target hardware, when, when this was invented, and here you see the, uh, the calls that were implemented by David Brownell. Um, that was an SOC that has a few lines of GPIO on the, on the SOC. It was invented for the ARM SOCs, uh, primarily strong ARM, I think. And um, uh, yeah, it was implicit that there is just one GPIO controller on the system. There is uh, no GPIO expanders or several instances, banks and such things, no, no, nothing like that. Um, the API um, here was merged eventually in 2007. Um, I was defined first, and then, then in 2007, the GPIO lib uh, driver's GPIO was created, again, by David Brownell. <clears throat> and he started to maintain it, not officially, but half officially. And um, um, it goes on for a while. Um, then David, who invented this, got very ill, um, and um, Grant Lightly took over the subsystem in uh, February 2011. Uh, I started to maintain it, and uh, in April, uh, David died. So no more work from him on GPIO. We are very grateful for his contributions, but it's one of the things that he never really could drive to the finishing line. Uh, I picked it up later the same year in... Um, uh, December, because Grant simply didn't have time to take care of it. I think he wrote in the commit when he took it over that I'm going to regret this, and he did quite quickly. And uh, also in December the same year, I uh, got uh, Alexandre Corbeau from uh, NVIDIA as a co-maintainer, and we have been bringing it forward since, um, uh, uh, since that time, 2011-12-13. I got it mostly because I created pin control, which is related as a subsystem, so Grant said you can have this too. First I said no, but uh, then he listed me as co-maintainer and then removed himself. Very clever. <laughs> <coughs> Biggest lies. You can in insert whatever um, burlesque quote you want here. Uh, it's somewhat of a meme, but GPIO is simple. It's, it's not. It turns out it's not. You think it's so simple, it's just one line, it goes up and down, and a GPIO driver should be nothing. It's just something that, uh, that sets a uh, register. And it can be like that. But um, it turns out that the infrastructure around the whole thing is actually pretty complex. So let's start with the engineer part, and now we're going to be inside the kernel. And later on in, the, in this uh, seminar, I'm going to switch over to talking about user space. <coughs> uh, 
and I want to share with you a few things that have uh, happened since uh, 2011 until now, the last five years. Because I've never lectured about them until now. I've, I, I've, I've done a lecture at the Embedded Linux conference about um, pin control. Very interesting. And I've done some kind of uh, smallish GPIO lecture on some Linaro Connect, but this time I'm going to uh, go over the changes we actually made. Because it makes a lot of uh, sense, and a lot of people, it turns out, haven't really noticed these things and still ask me questions about it. So let me share this with you. Um, I have separate slides for these things. Uh, we can just first name the few things that I fixed recently. If you want to use GPIO lib, the library, the driver subsystem, as it is now, just select GPIO lib. We used to have uh, two kernel symbols that's called uh, uh, arc requires GPIO lib, or uh, arc wants optional GPIO lib. Uh, and I, I never wrapped my head around that until I re read the change log. Um, the latter, like arc wants optional GPIO lib, that sounded like a wish list to Santa Claus or something. I never, I've, and, and then I asked the guy who submitted the patch and he didn't remember either why he called it like that. So just get rid of it. We select this subsystem just like we select all others. And uh, making it abstract code that gets compiled everywhere um, amounted to some work. So for example, user mode Linux crashed immediately because it doesn't have IO mapped memory. And we had to work around it. So now you can compile uh, GPIO lib actually for user mode. Not that I know what you would use it for, because there is no way out of it, but anyway, you can do it. Um, yeah, then we have this that, to add to the small things. GPIO ship add data, that's only that uh, the, the um, GPIO lib stores a pointer to your, your driver data in, internally, so because it will itself appropriate the, uh, the data pointer in the driver. So to help you out, we add another, another pointer. Some people think that the container of construction here is better, that's what we used before, usually. So the state container for the driver would have a GPIO ship embedded inside of it, and you would do container of to get the pointer to the uh, state container. And uh, it can be argued that that is more type safe to do it that way. Um, and I argue that this is uh, easier from a user perspective. Um, it's a matter of choice. If you can make a good argument for using container of and type safety, okay, I buy it. If you don't know what that is, and you think that container of is obscure, use this. <clears throat> so it's a matter of taste, I would say. Um, and much of the change that started from 2011 and forward and even earlier was uh, driven by the incentive to refactor the ARM architecture to use device tree or just generally clean up stuff. Get drivers out of the ARM architecture tree um, and now also other trees actually do it, MIPS, PowerPC and so on, move it down into drivers proper. Um, and um, another thing was the getting rid of the uh, um, getting rid of the global number space and get the uh, device-associated descriptors instead. Um, another, yeah, make it a real driver subsystem, make it a device, things like that. Uh, I will go into those details because I have separate slides about that. GPIO descriptors, that's, this is the big uh, refactoring that's been done inside the kernel and the big change. Uh, Alexandre Corbeau has driven it mostly. Um, the motivation is that the GPIO numbers are inherently unstable. You're used to, to uh, um, put, pass in a number or something here instead of a device pointer and names and so on. So it would say GPIO get. No, GPIO request, actually. We didn't even have a get function. So I'm already forgetting the old API. But uh, it doesn't work because it doesn't scale and it's unpredictable. Uh, imagine, for example, as I said in the beginning with GPIO, you would have uh, an SOC and it would have one GPIO controller. It's all right to have numbers, just 0, 1, 2, up to n, no problem. Now we have SOCs which have multiple GPIO controllers on them. 
And then we have GPIO expanders, and sometimes there's a secondary processor with GPIOs that you control from the first one. And um, Pro Border comes into play here, because if you don't hard code your GPIO number space, it will be controlled by Pro Border, uh, dynamically assigned a number. And um, then you hard code that number into a lot of platform data, or in worst case, start using it from the SysFS in user space. Uh, it's just a mess. Just complete disaster. Uh, some people just like to do this hash define games and really carefully uh, architecture and design like this number goes here, this number goes here, and so on. Um, that's, that's train spotting. We, do, we don't do that. We need to manage this by a machine. That's like getting a human to do machine's work, and that's never a good idea. Just never. So we need to dynamically assign. Um, descriptors to the GPIOs and not use fixed numbers. Um, so we have associated descriptors with the device. By using this pointer, uh, you can retrieve the deep GPIO uh, descriptor from device tree, ACPI, or board files. Actually, board files was the first file, uh, thing I supported. There is no there's no excuse whatsoever not to use descriptors on a new uh, architecture or system. There is no <coughs> excuse to not convert old architectures to use descriptors apart from time and effort or testing. So we have had um, a bunch of conversions going on here. But then, th then there are corner cases. Regulators is one. But generally, for any simple GPIO, use descriptors internally, in your drivers, everywhere. And it's so much neater. We get this opaque cookie here. And uh, let's say this device needs to de-assert a reset to be up and running. It's active uh, high. So when the reset line is high, the, the, the device is in reset state. So you just uh, issue this, associate with DevM here. We'll uh, garbage collect this when we remove it. Um, call it reset and say that uh, when you fire it up, when you retrieve this descriptor, set it low. This is all. It's done. Finished. Finito. It will be retrieved, set low, and then garbage collected when you remove the module. So very, I, it's, a, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a chosen example, but you get the picture. You can select here out high, of course, and you can also select as is if you don't want to touch the pin when you retrieve it. It will take some time to convert the whole world to using this. I, I'm aware of that. It's just so much better when you're dealing with abstract stuff instead of these fixed numbers. More stuff. <coughs> yeah, you, as I said, you, d you define these descriptors like this in a device tree, for example. There's a similar thing for the ACPI, but I don't understand ACPI, so I can't give you an example. But, uh, for example, here you specify that it's active high. And you can uh, specify active low, and that means if you ask the descriptor to go high, it will actually go low. So we'll just invert it. Sometimes you want that, sometimes not. There is also a GPIOD uh, API to do it uh, raw, so you actually control the actual value. If you want to. What is good with this is that here you can also specify in your device tree, and for the consumer, you are, you, you, are, you are defining it for the consumer, not like a hack in the GPIO controller. That, that was very common before, that people had their driver, and they said, let's, let's just hack in some extra numbers here, that I set a little bit of extra flags here and there. Uh, it's going to work out fine. But what they didn't think about was reusability, of course, because they hard-coded it to their system. And then when the next system was using the same driver, they got open drain on something that was used for something totally different. Here, you define for the consumer that you want it active high, and you can OR on flags for open drain, for example, here. Open drain and open source you can set. We will get to what that is. So no, no silly hard coding in the driver or special uh, platform data quirks or anything like this. No, no, define it here in the device tree. This consumer needs it to be active high or open drain or active low or whatever. You just put it there. Same thing for ACPI, but I don't know how it looks. Use any function prefixed 
GPIOD or DevM <laughs> in front of it is even better. So GPIOD is set val for, to set, set the value, GPIOD is set direction, so on. Or GPIOD direction input to GPIOD direction output, and so on. And I said the GPIO ship is now a real device. <coughs> so internally in the GPIO lib, it is a device. The, the struct GPIO ship that you used to know, that's what you register in your driver. That's ideally just static information. It's not, it's not really true, but ideally it's just static information that's passed, and then the subsystem instantiated a state container for it. And it's called like this GPIO device. Very straightforward. But this is private. This is for my subsystem. That's not for you to uh, play around with unless you're GPIO subsystem developers. Um, so this is hidden from the rest of the kernel. But it does contain a struct device like this. And that uh, device is uh, uh, registered on the bus. This bus GPIO is where it appears. This is not where it appears. This is the old SysFS interface that I hate. And um, as you can see, there's also a character device here. We will talk about that later. <coughs> but GPIOs, GPIO ships, they are now real devices after you instantiate them. And uh, we have added uh, Open Drain, open source, also known from the past as Open Collector and Open Emitter. Oh, I really love this. If you don't understand electronics, this is going to be very esoteric. We su support a callback in the driver called um, set single ended. That's the generic term for this kind of uh, open collector, open emitter, open drain, open source business. <coughs> uh, if you don't know it, these are transistors. This is CMOS uh, and TTL logic. Uh, and this is a typical uh, construction of a push pull gate. Um, if the hardware support open drain and open source configuration, uh, it will now be uh, possible to use that with the set, set, set and get single-ended uh, setting from the framework, from the dri driver framework, and it, it, it boils down to controlling these switches here. Um, that, um, that's also transistor in practice. But, well, uh, these are software controlled, and uh, not all systems have them. And some have a static configuration. They have just synthesized uh, their ship to have a thing like that instead of a push-pull construction. And uh, th that's called an open drain construction. Uh, open drain is used for level shifting, mostly. So as you can see, if this is the output pin and you have something pulling it up to VDD here, that VDD doesn't have to be the same uh, voltage level that's used inside of this ship. It can be 24 volts, no problem. You will get a 24 volt signal out. So you can drive your long distance serial cable or something with it. Well, that's awesome. Um, provided that um, uh, I, you understand the concept here, that either you short this with the in, and then you pull this line down to the ground so it becomes zero, and when you uh, close the gate, it will drift up to whatever is connected here. Uh, that's also used for wire or. Uh, constructions so that any uh, any um, any transistor on the line can pull it low, and it becomes a or a negative or for for the entire rail that is connected to it. That's also pop pop that's not so popular as uh, as popular as using it for uh, level shifting. So you can set say that I want to set this, this into open drain mode, then I flick the switch open, this, co this just goes numb, and uh, the output is just this transistor down here, I can set it to open source, then this one is disabled, and I just have this, and I can only drive it low, actively. <coughs> and that's exactly how it looks on the silicone, more or less. So it's kind of neat. Um, but un until now, we, we only emulated it in the GPIO library by um, by setting it as input. Well, if I turn this into an input, uh, I don't have a good illustration, but if you have done operation ampl amplifiers, you know what is the input resistance of an op ideal operational amplifier? Eternal. 
So it's uh, uh, infinite uh, input resistance. And that's, of course, uh, exactly what you get here when you turn off the gate. You get infinite resistance here, ideally. Not in practice, but ideally. So it will drift to, to whatever the line is pulled up by a resistor or so. That's nice. Um, so we have this. What we do not have is other stuff, other electrical stuff that you want to do over here in your gate. We can set, we can set open drain, open source. We can set push-pull, free states of the, of the single-endedness, the output modes. And that's because the GPIO lib has supported that for some time. We can also set uh, debounce with a special function, hackish. Driver can implement it. We cannot set biasing, like pull up, pull down. We cannot set um, drive strength, and that's uh, when you stack a few of these uh, output stages, so you get more drive strength out, uh, more milliamps out of the uh, the line, uh, and those things because they are generally considered pin control. And I have a separate lecture about pin control that I could give you, but that would take the rest of the day. So it's not going to happen. <clears throat> but you can read up on it. But the thing is, there are things you can do in pin control that you cannot at least yet do in, uh, in GPIO. Only open drain, open source, and uh, uh, debounce for now. Maybe we need to add some more stuff here. I will get to that in a minute. Mm. And we have pin control backends. Okay, let's continue with some pin control here. <coughs> this sort of presupposes that you understand what pin control is. I usually say that GPIO is about driving lines high and low. It has been so far. Now I also just gave you an example of open drain, so that's not really true. But it is something about driving lines high and low. And pin control has been uh, specifically of pins coming out of a package. Pins, balls, uh, um, what else do they call it? Pads. These kind of things that are on the edges of an SOC or circuit. Uh, those things and their electrical characteristics, their multiplexing and their biasing and drive strength and such things. That's generally considered pin control and pin config. Uh, Muxing is a separate sub sub system in the subsystem, and uh, config, electrical configuration of pins, is another sub sub system in the subsystem. Did anybody understand anything? <laughs> um, so, uh, since the pins are, are the physical place where the GPIOs come out, and the GPIOs here in the back somewhere is a separate IP block in many modern SOCs. You need sometimes to use it as a backend of, of the GPIO. There's, there's a pin control subsystem in the backend managing the electrical uh, and multiplexing and so on of the pin. And here in the front end, we have the GPIO, which is a little bit simpler. So we mapped the, the, the two subsystems together with something like GPIO ship add pin range. Tell us this GPIO ship with this pin controller, which we give by name. Um, from that offset of the GPIO local number space, not the global one, to that offset of the pin controller local number space, we map this number of pins. It's okay to pass one here if it's very sparse. Just add as many ranges as you want. Just make sure they map. You can also map by name here. This is a bit esoteric, I don't know. I think maybe one driver uses it. Then to get um, <coughs> get the pin controller to use this, you, you put these calls into your uh, GPIO driver. So in the request function, you call back to the pin control layer. In the free function, in the input and output direction uh, callbacks, you put these things. And it will call back into the pin controller and do these things for you. Nothing else. There's nothing to set any configuration and debounce and uh, biasing or driving and so on. Maybe there should be. I just didn't do it because, well, I didn't have a use case for it. If you have, you're welcome to come in and help out. Um, I am thinking that maybe we should have a callback that can set any config. One more callback, not 12. One more callback to set uh, config using the gener generic uh, pin config configuration options to let the GPIO subsystem put the pin into um, open drain or 
add free drive stages or a uh, Schmidt trigger, anything fun like that. But it has not yet been um, conceptualized or realized. Hmm? In the back end of the pin controller, now we are jumping over to another subsystem. It looks like this. You have to implement this. If you are using that on the, from the first slide, if you're calling back to the pin controller like this, your pin controller must, must <laughs> implement this. Otherwise, it's not going to work, and you're just going to sit there and look puzzled. So they, they, they fit together like this. <coughs> Request enable. That is going to max that very pin to, uh, to GPIO function. Same in this, it's going to free it up, and uh, then for setting the direction. And that's it. And also here, we would need to add another callback if we want to set some other configs. Preferably just one more. Then this one is something that people evidently know, don't know very much about. What this thing means, if you set it to true in your pin controller, it means that, that the pin cannot be used at the same time for GPIO and something else. Because it turns out a surprising number of systems actually allow you to use something as GPIO at the same time as it's used for something else. It's detailed in the documentation slash pincontrol.txt file. If you're interested in where, how you construct hardware to either do this or not, you can just go and re read that document. It's called the GPIO mode pitfall. It has something to do with the fact that um, the, the way you duct tape together these silicon blocks and the fact that uh, hardware engineers t tend to think about their I.O. cells as GPIO because they are general purpose for them. When you synthesize something on hardware, of course, you, you take a general purpose input-output cell and you synthesize it. So to a hardware en en engineer, that cell is very much general purpose input-output, right? You're following me now. But to me, as a software engineer, when they have purposed that input-output line for a specific purpose. It is no longer general purpose. It is special purpose. So it's, uh, it's not GPIO at all. Maybe it's special purpose UART, for example. Then it's not G GPIO thing. Um, but the hardware engineers do this, and then they go and write the manual, and then they write, this is GPIO. And that's where the confusion just starts to go all over the map, because people yeah, you have to think as a hardware engineer to get this right. You have to figure out what they were actually meaning when they wrote the data sheet. Sometimes they say, like, this is a GPIO line, and it's, it's very much not general purpose at all. <coughs> oh, now it gets tricky. Here's another thing I added to the GPIO lib. Uh, it's very useful. It's very nice refactoring. First, I, I realized that I started fiddling around with this, GPIO lock as IRQ. This is a good function, because if something is used as an IRQ, a GPIO line is used to generate an interrupt. You don't really want to switch that line to output mode, right? Because the logic will probably allow it and get you like, events fired all over. Of course, I can think of hacks. I can think of hacks where you absolutely want to do this. Then, then that's, that's the exception. The rule is. If something is in output mode, you probably don't want interrupts from it. And it's probably an error. Um, so out of that, well, then we started to uh, actually, you know, this whole interrupt business from GPIOs. GPIOs are more or less cascaded interrupt controllers or IRQ chips. Actually, that looks the same pretty much everywhere, especially if the hardware is simple. It's a register where you get a 0 or 1, depending on whether that GPIO pin fired an interrupt or not. And surely we can handle that uh, centrally in the GPIO library. <laughs> and we do. So you just select GPIO lib IRQ ship, you include the header, and then you use this GPIO lib IRQ ship add with the GPIO ship and the IRQ ship like that. Of course, you need to know what you're doing. You know to need to know exactly how, how to define that struct. So um, set type, for example, you absolutely have to understand what you're doing in set type. You have to understand like, what functions you have to, to uh, implement for your I IRQ ship. But once, once you understand that part, associating it with a GPIO ship um, and uh, telling it where to enumerate IRQs, this should be zero on all model systems, so we just pick something. 
dynamically on interrupt range. And uh, you can give a default handler here and um, a type, default type, uh, edge setting, for example, normally none. <clears throat> it will uh, help you out by constructing a IRQ domain, mapping all the uh, offsets to uh, IRQ numbers, uh, setting up the nested uh, thread, if this is a sleeping IRQ ship, and um, uh, generally just helping out and putting things into the library and managing it with central code, because it's quite a bit of code, and everybody gets it wrong. They forget one thing or another. Just use this, unless you have a very good uh, excuse. Yeah, so, so you do it in two steps. First, you associate them, and then uh, the IRQ domain and so on are created, and then you set a chained IRQ ship and say, like, this IRQ ship with this interrupt ship is going to uh, spawn, cascade off of this parent interrupt with this handler. And this you really have to implement, because it's the thing that reads out uh, a register and looks which bits are set to one and so on, and fire those interrupts and wait for them to go low. This handler is for uh, the default handler for the individual interrupt on the individual offset line on the GPIO ship. Did you understand the difference between this one and this one? It's the parent, which goes and cascades into a lot of children here. So they have different handlers depending on their, if they are children. This will be typically be something simple like uh, handle edge, uh, or what's the exact name? Handle uh, edge IRQ or handle level IRQ. And if your GPIO controller support, supports both edge and level IRQs, you can also have handle simple IRQ. If it, support, if it supports both and need, let me think, need to clear the uh, edge register, the first thing it does in its hard path in order to uh, be able to receive another edge while it is processing the previous edge, then you definitely need to have this to handle edge IRQ because it will call back into a special function in your IRQ ship that does exactly that, clears that bit and then continues processing. And some, IRQ, some GPI or IRQ ships will need to associate different handlers here depending on if it's an edge or a level IRQ because they need to clear that bit if it was an edge IRQ and do absolutely nothing if it was an, a level IRQ. Instead, just pull the register at the end of the function, see if, it's, if the, the flag is still there. And for that case, you actually have to assign this handler in the set type callback in your IRQ ship. And then, um, then what you should pass here is actually handle bad IRQ because everything is bad until it has got, has got the proper handler associated. There are examples, just grep in uh, driver's GPIO. PLO61, for example, the prime cell from ARM. Very good example on this. <clears throat> it is also possible now to have holes in this IRQ domain. So let's say not all of, of the interrupts uh, that can be generated or all the lines on this GPIO ship can actually be used to generate IRQs. So uh, Mika Westerberg from Intel, he added the functionality so that you can say, pass in a bitmap and say like this and this and this IRQ. No mapping, no using. That's helpful. And as I mentioned, you can have a sleeping communication here, and then the interrupt handler will become nested, and if it's not sleeping, it will be just chained. Do you know the difference between a nested and a chained IRQ cascade handler? Yeah, everybody knows it, I understand, okay. <clears throat> and uh, a cascaded one will just call down to all the cascaded IRQ ships in the hard IRQ context, from the IRQ signal to the processor, to the primary interrupt controller, down to the GPIO um, block, or even out onto the peripheral. Um, whereas a nested one will... Uh, Uh, it, it runs in an IRQ thread context, so you will have something with request threaded IRQ, and then um, it will handle in the top half just a quick callback to the um, uh, main interrupt controller of the system, and then shoot off the thread, and the thread will go out to a typical I2C device, 
Paul, it's interrupt register, 400 kilohertz maybe, I2C traffic, and um, then handle all the callbacks in a thread context. Absolutely necessary to do in the thread. It will not work otherwise because the CPU will not wait for that long. GPIO expanders typically on I2C do this. Both of them can be handled with this central code because they are both essentially very simple. But all the IRQ domain stuff, like map, unmap, map, translate, all that is inside GPIO lib here, and you cut quite a bit of code out of your driver, and it's quite a bit of code that everybody got wrong. So please use it if you can. And it will tear down and remove the IRQ domain and everything when the driver is removed. When you, there's even devm uh, GPIO ship add. So when that is unreferenced, everything will be torn down and disposed of, including mappings and IRQ domain and whatnot. There are excuses for using uh, some custom local handling, and those are typically hierarchical IRQ ships. Then we have hogs. Uh, that's when you want to set up thing, something at boot. Those are also new, and you can define in your device tree that you want this set up low at the boot time. And uh, don't do it when uh, it's easy to abuse. For example, when you, um, uh, you have too much, um, well, a reset line, for example, is not OK. But the bias line is, a reset line pertains to certain hardware. It should be handled by the driver. But uh, if you set up bias here, it's not really, uh, it's a board thing. It's not associated with any device. So then you can use hogs. But don't abuse it, please. Now let's go to user space. SysFS is dead. Use shardev. You have this in uh, SysFS. You have this in slash dev. From kernel 4.8, everything is there. It was released the other day, so start using it. No excuse to use the old stuff. I have marked this as for deprecation. The SysFS ABI has been marked for deprecation in 2020. We will see about that. I know I can't just remove things. But the good thing is that uh, this is a k-config option. You have to actually turn it on, actively turn it on. This one I have made it compiled in always. So there's no way getting away from this. And that's how I push it. So then the lazy people will be like, yeah, but I have, you have some library for this, but this is already available. I want to use this. That's nice. So that's how I enforce it. <laughs> the rules of Linux user space, GPIO. You do not access GPIOs from user space. You do not access GPIOs from user space. And all of, yet all of you do it. <clears throat> My god. You read this document, and then you use the char character device if you anyway have to do it. So I have been convinced that there are indeed use cases where you have to uh, um, access GPIOs from user space. But for push buttons, for uh, sensors, any bit bank GPIO, uh, I2C, SPI traffic, one wire, whatever you're doing, write freaking kernel drivers. Don't bit bang stuff from user space. I know it's fun. It's very Arduino to do it, but it's not engineering. It's, it's, it's fooling around. It's not the proper thing to do. Recompile your kernel. Have a good time. Write the driver. We need more people like that because it's the right thing to do. And with, I understand that the, all mechanisms for using, easily using device trees for things like uh, mezzanine boards and whatever they call them, it's not always really there. We had this session the other day discussing device tree overlays, which is the mechanism by, why you, by which you can plug in a board on top of your board and so on. But it's getting there. Uh, and for example, sensors, IIO, use IIO, use, use real drivers, even if they have GPIOs in the back end. Use the kernel internal GPIO API to get to them and write the real IIO driver. No fooling around, all right? <clears throat> but there are use cases where you have to do user space GPIO. I have been convinced. Industrial automation, factory lines doing with the Linux systems. I don't want, like, random kernel drivers for hydraulic press or uh, bottle filler or whatever. I mean, that, that doesn't make sense. Of course, you just want to drive that from user space. Control systems, or industrial control, robots and stuff. Um, fire alarms, door openers, 
and this very highly specific uh, domain specific systems. I don't want the door opener driver in my kernel. I understand that. You want to use this. You want to use the character device. <laughs> I'm not going to give any examples for this. It, the problem with the, with the SysFS, as I said, is it uses the, the global GPIO number space. Well, that's enough as an argument to remove it, really, because it's a mess and it can't be maintained. But it's also stateless, because it emulates states by doing export and unexport in SysFS, and creating mock devices for every one of these exports. So a new device is created every time you do export number so into uh, SysFS, and then it plops up as another uh, SysFS file. And if your script or whatever you're using program who did that crashes, and guess what? It's going to stay around forever until you reboot the system or go in there manually and remove the, the GPIO from export, export. Really, really stable, right? But there are so many hor horrible things with the, the SysFS that you can't imagine. It was unfortunately merged in the period between uh, uh, David Brownell getting too ill to maintain and Grant likely taking over. Um, but it, it, it's a big historical mistake. Don't use it. And it involves, of course, compulsory string parsing when doing context switch from kernel space to user space. Maybe that's not very much overhead, but it's still silly from an engineering point of view. I parse a zero or one or whatever. What is good about the character device? We have a discovery mechanism based on strings. We can look up GPIOs in user space by their name, if they have a reasonable name. You can also hard code an offset on a specific GPIO chip. It cleans up resources when you close or crash. So close the character device, everything is cleaned up, the GPIOs are available for the next client to use. You support open drain open source. I will not add support for this to the SysFS ABI. Forget it. It's obsolete. But you can do it with a character device. Go ahead. You can get and set multiple lines at once. And if the driver supports it, you can write several lines with one single register write. There are good examples on how to use it. So there is really no excuse not to use it, other than not being on kernel v4.8 plus. But that's not a problem, right? <laughs> You're not following main line? <laughs> Anyways, this is a little tool like LSGPIO. It will uh, look through all your ships and uh, I say that this chip has this name, that's just a helpful string. It has 54 GPIO lines and it goes on like this. Those are not really GPIO, I just, it's like, maybe you didn't want to see those even. I, I'm thinking about this, where we should mask off everything that's maxed for something else. But there's something GPIO here, active low, there's generic one and two and so on. This is from the Raspberry Pi, by the way. Oh, the maintainer was happy with it, so we're going to merge something like this, so you can just, uh, I've, Go in and uh, look through the GPIO ships I have in dev, look up uh, GPIO NAM, GPIO Gen3, and uh, that's where I connected my thing on this header thing. Let's bitbang it from user space and do our Arduino niche thing. That's much better than using SysFS, by the way. You can name these things in the device tree with GPIO line names. This is merge functionality. You can use it today for all of your boards, uh, lab boards, whatever. Go in. And it should be on the top level DTS file, usually, because that's a specific hardware. And the routing and uh, railing uh, is going to be specific to that one. You set up here the names of the GPIO lines. The names are up to you. <clears throat> if there is a specification for your board that says it should be named like this, use that name. That's the case, for example, for 96 boards. For Raspberry Pi, we are discussing it. If you don't have a better idea, use the rail name. That's usually what people are going to see in the schematic. This is how it works. You open this device, which will appear after. Um, it will appear by default with UDEV. I have patched BusyBox to also create it, because BusyBox had a bug that it didn't create uh, device nodes for devices that were bus only and didn't have a class. It's going to be fixed in the next release of BusyBox, which will be 1.26x. Just call an I.O. control on this thing that you open, get the chip info into this struct, and then you can print fields from it like that. Just check the header file, this one. This is not the kernel internal header file, mind you. 
This is the include UABI Linux GPIO.h file. This is user space. And uh, then you can check for a certain line, whether it's high or low or whatever, and uh, what name it has. This is just gets the information, so it's telling you the name, for example, of the line. So there's an information gathering ABI for uh, ships and lines. Then you can read lines, the values. Say you want to read offset four on your, this specific GPIO ship. This presupposes that you already opened the, this FD. That's the one from the previous slide. That's opening the device itself, just open on the GPIO ship. This, say, uh, line handle four, request only that line as input, call it push button. This will be what the kernel will name it, get the line handle, and uh, then you can um, get the value of it to this data here and print out the value here. Um, if you think that this arraying business here and telling how many is uh, awkward, I could add, have added another IO control to just handle one line. I mean, I understand that. But the, the neat thing with this, this is you can get and set many lines at a time. And that is indeed very neat. You can handle up to, this is 64 lines wide. So you can handle, uh, read and write 64 lines at one, once. So you can make a 64 line uh, signal analyzer, for example, and read all 64 lines with one, one IO control. Atomic, I don't know, it depends on the driver. I mean, if it's an expander, then it's gonna be um, doing I to C traffic or something like so, so it depends. Depends very much on the driver. It's probably not atomic at all, but it's fast. <laughs> uh, if the driver supports setting multiple lines with a single register write, it's gonna be writing atomically to those that share a single register. Uh, we don't have a get multiple call, Somebody write a patch. You over there, you over there. So it's a patch all drivers that can read some, several lines with a single register, right? That's also gonna be atomic in that case. But at least it has one context switch to kernel mode, and then it will loop over there and read with uh, several callbacks into the driver. So it's gonna be faster because you avoid the overhead of a context switch from user space to kernel space. We can optimize, but the, the infrastructure to optimize upon there is, is in place, and that's most my idea. You can request, uh, uh, let me see, here, as input. You can also add on that you want uh, open drain, for example, here, or active low, also very neat. Thing that you can't do with the uh, CFS. Same thing to write things. You say this one again, this one line. Request as output, call it blinker, get the line handle, set the data to one, and then set line values, set it to zero, set the line value, so you toggle it from one to zero like that. Last slide. Line events. This only handles one GPIO, because you're going to have to register an interrupt to handle events. You can, let, just to make it a little bit more tricky example, I set it to open drain. Both rising and falling edges. Get the line event for that thing. Read the event. This is based on IIO, same principle as IIO. And then you get the timestamp, and the rise, you can look here what kind of event it was, rising edge, falling edge, and print it out. Why do you want the timestamp? You want it to do sensor fusion, because that's something very important for um, sensor people, or anything that's rela related to whatever industrial control, really. Uh, the timestamp is something you want to co correlate with your accelerometer, gyroscope, or whatever, you, want to, uh, you probably want that, that's why I put it in there. I hope I was not wrong in putting it there. Your GPIO ship must support interrupts for this to work, otherwise the call will fail, that's sort of given. Um, so it will call eventually to IRQ and set up an IRQ handler, and that IRQ handler, handler will use a K FIFO to push events up to user space in a FIFO, uh, it's 16 events deep right now. We can expand it if you get overflow. Um, and uh, they will appear as interrupts. Go into the kernel, the interrupt is handled in the kernel, the event is pushed up to user space in this binary way, which is exactly the way that it's done in IIO, more or less. You just pull the file descriptor for these uh, structs. 
There are some future works on this. For example, uh, you might want to select, uh, th this uses the nanoseconds from 1970, I think, uh, this timestamp. And um, that's a bit coarse. People want to use the RTC or something like that. That is available in the IIO subsystem, so we might want to put that also into uh, GPIO for the character device so we can select them. There are some rough edges, but, but the ABI is there anyways. All right, I'm out of time. Um, I don't know if, if somebody else wants to use this uh, facility or if you want to put some questions or if you want to ask them in person. Does anybody have a very important question to ask? Did anybody understand anything of what I said? All right, then it's good because when I did the pin control uh, lecture at uh, the ELC and the USA, nobody understood what, understood what I, was, I was saying really because it was so complicated. And GPIO is a little bit simpler. So, okay, thank you then. <laughs>